They killed her, Leo. I think we're the demons now. Is there a charmed episode more fun to talk about than this? Piper, you've been exposed. If we can't fix this, it could undermine all the good that you've done and all the good that you're still destined to do. It is a finale in several senses of the word, being the last episode of Season 3, and also the last to feature Prue, meaning it's the last time the original three Halliwell sisters are on screen together. That, that's, that qualifies as a long shot. It was directed by her actress as well, and marked the third episode she'd directed, after the Season 2 finale, Be Careful What You Wish For, and Season 3's The Good, The Bad and The Cursed. Like I said, once a demon, always a demon. Hmm, two out of three times she directed her own death. And in actuality, every episode that precedes one Shannon directs has Prue being taken out of the plot to allow her more time to prepare due to the fast production schedule. In this case, the previous episode, Look Who's Barking, had Prue turned into a dog for most of the story. What else did you expect? A Doberman. The extra prep time obviously paid off because All Hell Breaks Loose is widely considered one of the best, if not the best, episode of the series. What are you? Yeah. While protecting a surgeon called Dr. Griffiths from a demonic assassin called Shax, Prue and Piper are accidentally caught using their powers on the morning news. But whatever it was, you saw it here, live. Both magic and their identities as witches are exposed to the world, leading to their house being surrounded and their faces all over the media. Prue, Piper, and Phoebe Hallowell. This newfound fame not only affects their ability to protect innocence, but leaves them open to attack from deranged humans. There's one of them being killed. Wait. The only solution is to contact Tempus, an antagonist demon from the season one finale who has the power to reset time. But the only one who can contact Tempus is the source of all evil himself, who will only agree to this if Phoebe stays in the underworld permanently. You should never do that. Not even to save one of her sister's lives. Even more pressure is put on her when Piper is shot by Alice, San Francisco's straightest shooting hippie. I killed the wicked witch! The wicked witch is dead! All Hell Breaks Loose is like Morality Bites in that it demonstrates when Charmed was able to do a certain type of story well. Maybe when Phoebe's done saving Cole, she can come back and save us. Morality Bites was a fascinating three-way character study on the nature of might and right, and examining the consequences of repeated selfishness. All Hell Breaks Loose is less character-driven, although it brings one character to a very interesting place, and is more plot-driven. 200,000 viewers saw it live. The average Charmed episode would involve finding a certain innocent to protect and a demon or warlock to stop but a major, overhanging theme of the whole series was preserving their cover as witches, or, as the trope is commonly referred to, the masquerade. I'm a vampire slayer. The masquerade is a handy form of conflict in any supernatural procedural. Not only do the protagonists have to fight the forces of evil, but they also have to keep what they're doing secret. The reasons why are up to the whims of the writer. Honey, are you sure you're a vampire slayer? Buffy, for example, keeps her slayer identity hidden from her mother up until the end of season two, and in that it's played very much like a coming out narrative. It's because you didn't have a strong father figure, isn't it? Sabrina has to because of laws about what will happen to people who can't keep her secret. Spider-Man and many other superheroes hide so as to avoid people coming after their friends and families. And most of these stories were envisioned by Jewish creators as parallels to having to hide their religion. Any story that employs the masquerade will usually examine what happens when it's finally exposed. This thing's gonna get ugly fast. Charmed naturally involves a worst case scenario, where the sisters can't even leave their homes to fight evil, and they need constant police surveillance to stop fans from breaking in. Harry Styles sympathises. And in a twist, not only do the sisters want to regain the masquerade, but so do the demons. Have we been exposed? What business is it of yours? The show never outright states why evil would want to stay hidden, but here are my thoughts from what evidence were given. The majority of demons and other evil beings enhance their powers or benefit from messing with mortals and good magical beings, this season even confirming that demons can pose as judges and lawyers. So in that event, a target who's unaware of your existence is preferable to one that knows and can be ready for you. And also, whenever good witches stumble across them in public, evil has an advantage in a fight because good is still trying to preserve cover. So the masquerade ultimately benefits evil in many ways. Come again? A season 6 episode, My Three Witches, would examine a scenario where neither side needs to stay hidden, 
and the result is an all-out war between good and evil. Yeah, all magic all the time, just what I wanted. And it's interesting to me how all hell breaks loose, with its intent to create a worst case scenario of the Halliwells being exposed, captures the zeitgeist of when it was made. Look at all these interview requests we're getting. Ted Koppel, Time Magazine, Jerry Springer. The episode was broadcast on May 17th, 2001, right at the start of a boom period for an industry we all know and despise. I can tell that you're watching me and you're probably gonna like what you didn't see. The paparazzi were of course always a staple of celebrity culture, and the famous people of the world viewed them as a necessary evil to promote their brands. But there's no denying that the early 2000s was a whole different ball game, and it was the first year of the decade that started the new game, when Us Magazine went from a monthly to a weekly specifically to compete with the celebrity-focused People and Entertainment Weekly, even changing its style to focus more on gossip about famous people. In a short space of time, other celebrity magazines were covering newsstands, and the public lapped it up. Can you please respect my privacy? Freelance photographers could collect five figures for the most mundane pictures of Hollywood stars, and the laws in the US meant that anyone with a good camera and connections could get in on the game. And in a world right before social media, where the internet was nowhere near as widely used, they called the shots. I could get on my soapbox about the general awfulness of the paparazzi, but we're talking about charm here. Sports Illustrated. Yeah, they probably want you for the swimsuit edition. And the show captures that early 2000s culture of information being shared quicker than ever, but not instantly, and the rush to be the first one to report a new story, regardless of whose life it could ruin. Alana? Here we are approaching the home of where they allegedly live. I mean, Alana is probably thinking she can retire herself off being the one to get this story. But we can't put the genie back in the bottle, Dave. The show plays this both ways, with the familiar light-hearted tropes like people who barely knew the person on the news trying to get their 15 minutes, and all the talk show hosts wanting an interview. Okay, so what do you say, Oprah or Barbara? If only Alice had waited. Barbara makes you cry. We go with Oprah. I like these little moments of Piper trying to make light of the situation, because really, that's totally what you would do if that happened. Who's joking? And playing this stuff as inconvenient but funny makes it all the more effective when we get to... Just like that. <gasps> In this moment, the episode turns from a fun, consequence-free what-if plot that'll be resolved at the end to something much darker. <laughs> I'm cold. One of the ways in which Charmed was seen as the lighter twin of Buffy is that one main character was an in-house healer who made it very hard to injure the Halliwells long term. You guys almost died, that's what happened. Yeah, well what else is now? The sisters had been killed in demon battles before, and they'd found ways to remove the safety net and raise the stakes in other episodes, but they do so here in a way that really makes it hurt. <laughs> Piper isn't killed instantly, or with a spell or energy ball that leaves no marks. It's a human injury, and she slowly bleeds out like a normal gunshot victim. Oh god. Full arrest. Paddles. I called Piper's death on the operating table startlingly realistic in my first video, and it's so raw that it makes you feel like you're personally watching someone die. Prue isn't crying in a glamorous Hollywood way, she's howling and screaming covered in her sister's blood. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's one of the most effectively emotional scenes across the whole series, and even when you know time is going to be reset and Piper will be okay, it still stings. It also goes without saying that Shannon acts her ass off. Turns out she's one of those actors who can direct herself to a very high standard. <laughs> I've always loved the way this episode plays around with Prue's character, and I find it especially fascinating that this is the episode her actress chose to direct. We shouldn't have followed Shax into the street. We didn't have a choice, Piper. Didn't we? Prue from the beginning was the leader who kept everyone in line, eventually evolving into a fearless demon hunter who was the most gung-ho about saving innocence. I swear I'm working on it. It's a constant struggle. Episodes in this season such as Sight Unseen, Death Takes a Halliwell, and San Francisco had examined this persona, but her final episode takes it into outright deconstruction. Sure, we could have let him kill our innocent. That would have been better, you think? Another safety net in the average Charmed episode was in how the narrative would often bend to validate Prue's actions, even if they were reckless or impulsive. Oh, that's bad. 
Here, those qualities are what cause most of the problems in the plot. They're not the ones that screwed up. How does the whole mess get started, when Prue goes dirty Harry on Shax and recklessly pursues him to the outside, without checking the exposure risk? Especially when the innocent wasn't in any immediate danger. Lucky nobody saw us. Similar later on when they vanquish Shax for real, managing to get themselves caught on the news again. News at 11. Many times throughout the series, Prue would charge into fights with demons half cocked and the narrative favoring her impulsiveness. Everything that we've worked for could be completely destroyed with, with one stupid mistake. Here, it's her impulsiveness that makes things go from bad to worse. Like when Alice breaks into the manor and she could have literally relied on the cop or the lady who freezes time to defuse the situation. Are you nuts? This is our home. Get out of here! But obviously what we're really here for is when this deconstruction of the Prue Halliwell persona reaches its darkest moment. She has to drive Piper to the hospital, what with Leo being MIA, and the press and protesters and whoever won't clear the way. So what does she do? This is the only time in the series that Prue uses her powers on innocence. And look at the absolute chaos. <laughs> Prue most likely killed a lot of people there, and I love it. A charmed one who's got nothing left to lose, has exhausted all her patience, and no longer needs to worry about protecting her secret. You know who she reminds me of? <laughs> but seriously, fucking phenomenal work by Shannon here. Go! If she could pull off this kind of quality directing herself. This has to end now or our lives are over. And as fine as I am with this being Prue's swan song, the possibilities of an arc involving her making a full on heel turn and becoming an antagonist do make us wonder. <laughs> Can you make this right or not? It's very timely that this is the episode Prue dies in. The one that deconstructs her usual persona and brings the character to these places. This thing has to end now, okay? There's something so convenient about how some of our last images of Prue are ones where we find out what she would do if she lost everything. What are her last lines before time gets reset? Don't worry, he's gonna fix it. And her final act merges those two character traits that were both her greatest flaw and biggest virtue. No! <laughs> that recklessness in the pursuit of doing the right thing and how she'd never hesitate in the face of self-sacrifice. When facing their first warlock in the series, she puts herself between Jeremy and her sisters to ensure they get to safety. And in jumping in front of Shax's blast, she ends up ensuring that once again. Your baby sister. Their baby half-sister. by my half. Her actions also led to a lost young woman eventually finding her family. And while none of this could be what she intended, as someone who knows the character through and through, she'd be very happy with the results. Welcome home. So even if I wish there could have been a more definite kill-off scene, this really does feel like the perfect ending for her. And since this was directed by her actress, who also said she was pushing for the death, it's safe to say she agrees. Personally, and I thought it was time for the show, because a show like that needs to stay fresh. This episode marked the end of an era, but what an end and what an era it was.